welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the 94th episode of The Simple Sophisticate. We are going to dive in today to a topic that we come back to every once in a while here on the podcast as well as on the blog, but with regards to the title, The Truths and Myths of the Independent Single Woman, I want to make sure that my married readers are not turning off the dial because this is really a topic about women and society at large. And I think, and it's definitely not an attack on men um, or not even an attack on marriage at all. It's just simply about the ways in which the single woman's life has been changing how our society is functioning. And I think you'll find it quite fascinating. I know I did. Today's episode is entirely inspired by a new book that came out by Rebecca Traster called All the Single Ladies, Unmarried Women, and the Rise of an Independent Nation. And with that in mind, I want to share a quote that she gives us in the introduction. It says, Contemporary unmarried life may have felt a lot more complicated, confusing, and scary than the simply single option on offer to women of previous generations. But the wholesale revision of what female life might entail is also, by many measures, the invention of independent female adulthood. So that's going to set the tone for today, the shift in society. How did we get here? What does it mean? What does it mean not just for single women, but for all women and all people? Now, before I get to today's episode, I want to give you a, a, an idea of what today's petit plaisir is. And it actually is something that ties directly with this episode. And for no other reason than this book has been consuming my time and my attention and my curiosities. And so I've really just thrown myself into that, making sure that I could make this the best episode I could make it because I find it has a lot of quotes and support that I want to make sure that you hear so that you can then come up with your own ideas and your own opinions. Um, Anyway, so today's Petit Pleasure is directly tied to today's episode and the book. With that said, let's get started. I want to start with a quote, very, very simple, short quote. Single female life is not prescription, but it's opposite liberation. Again, All the quotes I share today, unless otherwise stated, are from that book by Rebecca Traster. But the liberation extends to all women, to all people, married or single, gay or straight. Why? Because as Traster points out in her book, which synthesizes five years of research, quote, single women are taking up space in a world that was not built for them, end quote. And doing so with success that, while gradual, is revealing the internalized assumptions that may have been based on suiting a small few rather than the many. Today's episode, as I mentioned at the top, is not an attack on marriage or men. Today's episode is an opportunity to see the truth of how and what is going on in the lives of women today. And to perhaps, as Kathy Pollitt puts it in her review of the book, put a, quote, fascinating, surprising, and heartening, end quote, light on the single woman in America and the doors she has been helping to open for all of us. So let's get to the truths. We'll start with the truths. Number one, there are more single women than married. As of 2009, the proportion of American women who are married dropped below 50%. Whether divorced, separated, widowed, or never married, more people were out of wedlock than in. In fact, today, only 20% of Americans are wed by the age of 29 compared to 60% in 1960. Interesting food for thought, no doubt. Truth number two, marriage is often the catalyst for women's rebellion historically. 
1969, quote, University of Chicago sociology professor Marlene Dixon wrote that the institution of marriage is the chief vehicle for the perpetuation of the oppression of women. The role of the wife has been the genesis of women's rebellion throughout history, end quote. And the women at the forefront of many of these rebellions were single women or single during the time in which they petitioned and fought for change. For example, Susan B. Anthony, Alice Paul, Gloria Steinem, Clara Barton, Florence Nightingale, Pauline Hopkins, Frances Willard, and Louise May Alcott, just to name a few. So why then does the paradox persist that historically marriage has been rebelled against, yet modern society still holds this life decision on a pedestal determining whether we've reached, quote, adulthood or worthy of earning certain political rights and privileges? So truth number two is marriage is often the catalyst for women's rebellion historically. Truth number three, solitude is a forgotten necessity. The power of solitude, as we talked about a few weeks ago here on this podcast, is vast in its benefits and absolutely magnificent for all sorts of reasons. But it's hard to find when others, such as a spouse and children, have schedules and demands that we are expected to tend to. But perplexingly, companionship is what is perpetuated as being the desired state. So we must want to be coupled, at least that is what society would have us think, and if we don't, there must be something wrong with us. Ironically and historically, quote, in all cases, women's yearning for liberty can be just as keen as the pull toward companionship that has been more widely advertised. Now, that is not to say companionship is bad, but rather only equal, not superior to solitude. As Megan Tracer puts it, a surprisingly sweet relief. So truth number three is solitude is a forgotten necessity, no matter which life path we choose. Now to the myths. Myth number one, single women are a drain on the government. The truth is men have been reliant on the government since its formation in the 18th century. Quote, it's the government that has historically supported white men's home and business ownerships through grants, loans, incentives, and tax breaks. It has allowed them to accrue wealth and offer them shortcuts and bonuses for passing it down to their children. Government established white men's right to vote and thus exert control over the government at the nation's founding and has protected their enfranchisement since. End quote. Simply because new laws begin in the 1970s that afford women the ability to divorce, have equal access to credit, availability to birth control in or out of marriage, and equal funding of college sports programs, this is just the beginning of the list, mind you, this is more of a rectifying than an excess of protection that women have fought for since the late 18th century. After more than two centuries of a lack of government protection, it seems to be far past due and still has miles to go. Myth number one is single women are a drain on the government. Myth number two, being single equates to being lonely. Well, it's bad math, or should I say bad science, that is perpetuating this fallacy of why someone feels lonely. In actuality, here's a quote for you. Journalist Judith Schultzowitz has pointed to recent studies showing that chronic loneliness is a medical condition that takes place on a biological, cellular level that at least part of the propensity for the condition is hereditable, and that part of the rest of it has to do with conditions we face as newborns and children long before anyone is being encouraged or discouraged from pairing off with another individual. Hmm. (laughs) So rather, being lonely or feeling lonely is defined as the want of intimacy. And as many people know, marriage doesn't have a stranglehold on offering intimacy and neither does it guarantee it either. It is important to note, Tracer points out, if loneliness is a want of intimacy, then being single lends itself to loneliness because the loving partnerships we imagine in comparison are always in our minds intimate. They are not distant or empty or abusive or dysfunctional. End quote. This golden cage may be what some married folks are contained within, appearing to be beautiful to outsiders, but a trap for those that are not in a relationship that offers the intimacy we seek. So keep all those factors in mind when we talk about what it really means to be lonely. What is it that has to go on in our life for us to be lonely? And ultimately, the core of it is just simply wanting intimacy. 
So myth number two is being single equates to being lonely. Myth number three, singles will become stuck in their ways and unable to make room for another. (laughs) The longer someone has lived their life uncoupled, the more typically married, considerate loved ones quip, there is a less likelihood that you will be able to successfully be coupled because you will have become set in your ways. However, to become set in our ways is more of a reflection that we have become more clear about who we are, what we can and cannot live without. As Traster speaks from her own experience of dating in her 30s, the truth is the fierce protection of my space, schedule, and solitude served as a prophylactic against relationships I really didn't want to be in. Maybe I was too hard on those guys, but I'm also certain that I wasn't very interested in them. Hmm. So myth number three, singles will become stuck in their ways and unable to make room for another. Myth number four is that single equals being selfish and immature. I'm going to start right off with a quote here. In many ways, the emotional and economic self-sufficiency of unmarried life is more demanding than the state we have long acknowledged as married maturity. Being on one's own means shouldering one's own burdens in a way that being coupled rarely demands. It means doing everything without the benefits of formal partnership. Now, clearly the quality of one's marriage will determine how equally shared life's demands are. But historically, quote, women's lives have been meant to be selfless to husbands, to kids, to priests, to God, to parents and community, end quote. More recently, studies have shown unmarried individuals are less selfish than their married peers and more socially and civilly involved, as reported by the Council on Contemporary Family and Eric Kleinenberg, respectively. So myth number four is being single means that you are selfish and immature. Myth number five, being married ensures a happier, healthier life. This one's going to be short and sweet, but here it is. The truth is happy and healthy people tend to be more likely to marry should that be their desired path. Being married doesn't ensure a better life. Rather, entering into a marriage when we are already a healthy, secure individual is a fundamental tool that will help to ensure a happy and healthy life in the future. So myth number five, being married ensures a happier, healthier life. Myth number six, women are meant to have children. Well, the truth is, whether we're married or not, women are having children, but there is less of a stigma to do so if one doesn't have the, quote, child fire within her, as shared by one of the contributors. Here's a statistic for you. In the 1970s, one in 10 American women concluded her childbearing years without having a child. While in 2010, it was almost one in five. Some of the increase in childless women, around half, can be attributed to women who want but cannot have children. And the other half are child-free by choice. Anne Friedman shares, quote, We're well aware that we lose fertility at a certain age, but also that we lose professional power after we have kids. While many women have children, seeing them as the legacy they leave behind, Traster writes, it's too rarely acknowledged that there are millions of ways that women leave marks on the world and that children, having children, is but one of them. Again, the reminder is apparent. Simply having the choice, not the mandate, is what brings the liberation for all of us. And on this note of women and children and and work and trying to have it all, we've talked about it before on the blog. I believe it was in 2012 when Anne Slaughter had an article in The Atlantic and then she further came out with a book about this whole idea of redefining this idea of having it all. Really what it's going to have to come down to, and Tracer's book is primarily about this, and I'll let you read more of the details, is that unless women start speaking up with their vote or in elected office or in any other way that's going to change the laws and protections and the ways of life, the the, the norms aren't going to change as far as daycare or when children get off school or... um even with regards to how much college costs, because people feel they have to have two jobs to send their kids to college. The power comes, as Tracer points out, when we express what we need. And many ways, that's by going and voting. That's primarily the only way with regards to our modern society. And we have to have people who know what that experience is like. 
And that is what we mean by having women or people with varied experiences that represent um, us in our politics. So it doesn't have to be a woman. It doesn't have to be a certain ethnicity, but it definitely needs to be um, a voice that represents who we are and what our values are. And everyone's values are different. But the key, as Ann Slaughter speaks out about, is to be honest about the realities of life and what will work and what will not work. So that's myth number six. Women are meant to have children. Myth number seven Last but not least, say this one till the end. Studies haven't proven being married equates to unhappiness. As anyone who is in a loving, supportive marriage involving two equals will likely tell you, it is hands down rewarding and worthwhile. But the other truth is that it takes dedication and work. And please uh, don't confuse the word work with hard work. But it is an effort, a choice to involve someone in your life, to be thoughtful when you've had a bad day, to compromise, to, con- to understand them, to, to learn how to communicate effectively, to understand their love languages, as we talked about back in February. And because of that, this kind of relationship is rare, but it's not impossible. The author of the book, which is the inspiration and the source for today's episode, is now married and has children, having married at the age of 35. But as she states in her opening line, I always hated it when my heroines got married. Marriage is not a pinnacle. It's a choice. It should be a choice. And being single should also be a choice. Neither receiving more or less protections or benefits as one way of life is exalted and the other pitied. Life continues after marriage. And I think you'll find that's really what she's driving at in her introduction. And a woman's dream should be allowed to grow as well after marriage, should that be the path she chooses. For if a woman's dreams are squashed because of nuptials, how free is she really? Here's a quote for you. We simply don't ask the same questions about the fates of women who marry, even the simple fears, dissatisfactions, loneliness. Yet we easily and always consider single women's equivalent states as tied to their unwed status. The premise is faulty that happiness is equated to being married. Now people may have fallen into the mind trap of accepting this that they will only be happy if they get married because it's hard to live in such a way that's, that society doesn't understand. But at the heart of it, it's not marriage that determines one's happiness. It's being able to live your truth, to be authentically you. On April 16th, this coming spring on HBO, um, they will be releasing a film called Confirmation starring Kerry Washington as Anita Hill. This, this film depicts a national event here in the States that single-handedly began the conversation about sexual harassment at the workplace and was the catalyst of the what's been coined the, the Year of the Woman, which ushered in five women into our U.S. Senate in 1992. Now, currently we have 20 women in our Senate out of 100, but at the time that was the most women we'd ever had in our Senate, five. And I'll have a link to that particular article. And so this film depicts the testimony of Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas's former colleague, Anita Hill, and the events of her questioning and the public response to how she was questioned by an all-white, all-male Senate Judiciary Committee. Anita Hill was interviewed by Traster in 2013 for this book, All the Single Ladies, and pointed out that when women have, quote, sexual and professional agency, it will force the country to think about women's work experiences differently, about the hours and days in the workplace, about the economic implications, the cultural and political implications. The underlying reality is that the women of the world are diverse in their desires, our desires, our passions and our callings, and quote, by truly reckoning with woman as both equal and independent entity, we can make our families, our institutions, and our social contract stronger, end quote. The doors can be opened for all of us, for whichever path we choose, if we understand there are many ways to live and contribute to the society we live in and want to live in in the future. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. I know we covered a lot of interesting topics, and I encourage you to read Rebecca Tracer's book before um, diving into 
aspects that I maybe didn't touch on. She covered so much. It is a wealth of a research. It's receiving critical acclaim and it is already a bestseller, even though it's only been out for a week and a half. Um, I will provide a link to the book on today's show notes. And in fact, today's petite pleasure is her book, All the Single Ladies, Unmarried Women and the Rise of Independent Nation. But it's also her first book, um, which actually came out after the 2008 election called Big Girls Don't Cry, The Election That Changed Everything for American Women. And um, as I said, she spent over five years researching this book, and it definitely shows, um, having read a handful of the books that she cited, as well as um, noting various historical elements that um, help support her argument with regards to the effects women from decades and centuries ago um, have played and why and how we're living today. It's absolutely fascinating. It's a fantastic research. It's something to just be aware of. You, you, obviously, we can have opinions on either side of the aisle. That is the, that's the gift. That is the gift for us to all have our opinions and base them on fact, but then base it on what we value and create or vote for the way of life that we feel is best for us. But we need to be clear about the reality. We need to be clear about our history um, and see instead of being told um, what our history is. So this is just an introduction really to her book. I hope you do dive into that book and I would welcome your conversation. You can find all of the links for today's show notes on the simplyluxuriouslife.com backslash podcast 94. And I've also included a handful of archive posts that deal with this topic somewhat. For example, how to live alone well, why not be a feminist and what that really means, how to become the woman you've always wanted to be, and so many other episodes and posts that we've talked about or shared here on The Simply Luxurious Life or The Simple Sophisticate. I do hope you stop by. And thank you for tuning in. I hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. For more ideas and inspiration throughout the week, stop by the blog, the Simply Luxurious Life com or pick up the book choosing the simply luxurious life a modern woman's guide until next monday i'm your host shannon abels bonjour